Hi, today I'll be talking about this paper, which is basically about the protein WSPR, or as I like to say, WHISPR, and its ability to form clusters within the Pseudomonas bacterium. This paper is written by Dr. Harwood and a few professors from UC Santa Cruz. It's a very compact paper, so I'll do my best to unpack it. So this is the big picture they paint in the beginning. Basically, there's this wisp A, and it gets stimulated by the presence of a surface. Then it kind of activates wisp E down here, which phosphorylates wisp R, and then that makes CDGMP. CDGMP will induce the formation of exopolysaccharide and ultimately biofilm formation. So basically, the presence of a surface induces pseudomonas to make biofilms. And the, the part of this process that they really zoom in on is this phosphorylated whisper right here. In this next slide, we can see a protein image of WISP-R. This is the dimer format. And there's basically three main regions. We have a receiver domain. Uh, and then we have a stock linker domain, which forms the dimers or the tetramer form of WISP-R. And then we have this domain, which is the, they call it the cyclase domain. It basically is what makes the CDGMP. Um, and then in the paper, they basically mutate this protein in six amino acid sites. Each of those mutations will either activate or inactivate WISPAR in one of these three domains. Uh, one of the one really important site to note is this D70 here. This is the site that gets phosphorylated by WISP E, and uh, it's phosphorylating this site is really important for activating the protein. We'll see that in this particular mutant, whatever else you throw at the protein, it just won't work because this phosphorylation site is basically broken. So now in this image, we can see the clustering phenotype that they've been talking about. Uh, here they tag the WISPAR with a fluorescent protein. And in the wild type, we can see that in broth, there are no cluster formations. But on an agar surface, we do see some clusters forming. So it just kind of reinforces how the presence of a surface stimulus will activate WISPAR. Uh, also here, we can see in some of these mutants that even without a surface stimulus, they will make, oh, sorry about that. They will make these clusters, so they're kind of locked in this active stage. Whereas with these mutations, even in the presence of a surface, they won't make any clusters, so they're locked in an inactive stage. Particularly D70, V72, these are mutations to the receiver region, so they just don't kind of get activated in the first place. Uh, and then one, L167 is a mutation that affects the protein's ability to make tetramers. So it kind of proves that making tetramers is important for WISPAR to make a cluster. This table is a little bit more exhaustive in the information it shows. Uh, in these two columns with WISPA mutant, wisp -A is basically the protein that responds to the surface. So without a surface kind of response, uh, none, of the, none of the mutants will make any kind of clusters. So it's really highlighting the importance of responding to a surface to activate WISP-R. In the WISP-F mutant, this mutant basically deletes the negative feedback of CDGMP so that CDGMP normally will inhibit WISP-R after a certain extent, but without WISP-F that doesn't happen. So you can see that uh, all of, basically all of these are kind of saturated with clusters here. With the exception of D70 and V72, these mutants can't get phosphorylated, so they just don't make clusters in the first place. And then this is the wild type. The other two examples were kind of like the positive and the negative control. And the wild type, we can see 
that they would uh, all of all of these strains basically make some clusters inside the broth, but they make more clusters inside on a surface, kind of reinforcing how the surface is important. And once again, the two exceptions are D70 and D72. So now that we kind of looked a little bit on which mutations make clusters, uh, they wanted to analyze how the biofilm aspect is also affected. And here, the they equate biofilm formation with the amount of wrinkliness on the bacterial colony. Basically, if there's more wrinkliness, there's more biofilms being done. And so we can see some of these colonies here, each one with a mutation. Uh, basically, the trend is that as there's more clusters, there's more wrinkliness, there's more biofilms being formed so that the, clus the clusters of WISP-R is important for inducing biofilm formation. Again, there's an exception here with the V72. Uh, it's interesting to know that even without any clusters of WISP-R, it's really active in making biofilm formation and inducing CDGMP. So this is just, this guy is kind of like a mysterious mutant here where it doesn't, it can't get phosphorylated, but it's still very active for the overall phenotype. And then the other exception is, on, is over here in E25-3. Uh, this one makes a little bit more sense because this mutation affects WISPR's ability to make CDGMP. So even if we can get a whole bunch of clusters of WISPR, it still just won't be able to make CDGMP because of this mutation. But other than these two exceptions here, basically the more clusters we have, the more wrinkliness, the more biofilms are being made inside the bacterium. This final figure here is really important for revealing why clustering is important in the first place. Uh, you can see on the bottom axis is the concentration of WISPAR in vitro. And on the left axis is the specific activity of WISPAR, basically how much CDGMP it's making per minute. And in some of these strains, we'll see that as the concentration increases, the specific actively, activity highly increases. So it basically shows that the clustering is important because it dramatically increases the specific activity of WISPAR. But this only really matters when WISPAR is phosphorylated, which is what the, the beryllium fluoride 3 means. It's basically acting as phosphorylation. Without phosphorylation, even if you increase the concentration, the specific activity of WISPAR does not increase. An interesting exception, once again, is V72, where it's always actively making a little bit of CDGMP. And whether you phosphorylate it or not, or whether you increase its concentration or not, it doesn't really make a difference. So this, it's interesting to know that this version of the protein is just locked in a mildly active state where it's just always making a little bit of CDGMP, but it just won't, for some reason, make a cluster. And my reasoning uh, independently is basically that uh, the 70, this V72 is you know, originally a valine, and then they change it to an aspartate which has a highly negative uh, functional group, basically that, kind of, that can kind of mimic a phosphate group. And it's so close to the D70 site, which is the original phosphorylation site. Basically this really negative side group so close to the D70 site can sort of mimic a phosphorylation such that this particular mutant is just locked in a semi-phosphorylated state just because of this negative side group here. So that's my reasoning of what's going on with this mutant. But the overall result is that uh, concentration and clustering is important for making this WISPAR protein really active. So again, this paper was pretty short, but it was really compact. There was a lot of data, and this is the overall picture that they put at the end. Uh, Wisp R here basically gets phosphorylated and then it makes clusters. These clusters will make C 